Archives are about space and about time. There is always a hidden something that we have to look for very carefully. A hidden concept, a hidden document, and a hidden narrative. How can we preserve an archive? And how can we preserve documents in an archive? Archives are very important as a protest against forgetting. If we want to anticipate the future, the lessons of history as a discipline are central to the art of archiving. The future is sometimes invented with fragments from the past. Yeah, I'm so glad that we can do this conversation for our friends, uh, Norman and Elena Foster. Yeah. Uh, and uh, maybe to begin with the beginning, I wanted to ask you how it all started. How, how did you come to architecture or how did architecture come to you? Oh, me personally? Yeah, in your work, yeah. I, I think as a fairly young child, I decided I wanted to be an architect. Yeah. Around about 12 years old or something like that. So I, I was at college in, London, in Blackpool at the time where my parents lived. Yeah. And I studied uh, mathematics, physics and art at advanced level at, at college. And uh, then applied to university and got, it, got accepted, went into study. But uh, one of the first things my art master at college was very enthusiastic. I don't know if you know the book by Sternell and Marasmussen, Towns and Buildings. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so that was an inspiration. Yeah, so he, gave, he gave me that when I was still a student at, at college. So, yes, that was very much uh, an inspiration. Beautiful book. I mean, I still recommend it to my students. So. Yeah. And who were the architects who inspired you in terms of, you know, the future is often built or maybe it's fragments from the past. Who, who would be the architects from the past who inspired you? Well, do you know Blackpool at all? Yes. So you know the casino building? Yeah. There? So Emberton, Ember obviously, I mean, he did three buildings on the Pleasure Beach there. The casino is the well-known one, but he also did a fun palace and the entrance gates to one of the big dippers. Uh, and you were born in Blackpool and then you, you studied, you know, in Manchester. That's uh, right. And of course, you, you were instrumental in getting the, uh, in getting the archive also of, uh, of Archigram, you know, started, which is by, of course, uh, we spoke about this with Elena now and first about it is so relevant. Uh, one of the many reasons why it's so relevant to have you in this series of conversations about the archives. And um, I wanted to ask you before we talk about the Archigram archive, it's always interesting to see how groups start, you know. Um, so I'm interested in beginnings of the group and the Archigram. Uh, if you could tell us a little bit about your memories, how this uh, um, seminal group started uh, and how the name was found for the group. Well, there, there are two parts to the beginning of the Archigram group. I, as I said, I studied in Manchester and a good friend of mine, a man called Alan Waterhouse, uh, we all graduated in the same year, but I stayed on to do a postgraduate study in urban design. Alan came down to London and worked for the LCC and he there was working with Ron Heron. And the, the first, they were working on the Woolwich Polytechnic building at the time. Yeah. The, the London County Council then started the South Bank Development Group around about 1960. And Ron was part of that group and he brought Alan in and Warren Chalk was also part of that group. It's under a man called Norman Engelback. And I, at that time, I'd graduated and finished my postgraduate course and was working with Frederick Gibbard. And Alan and I kept in contact whilst he was in London. And um, Alan suggested that I join the South Bank group with uh, Ron and Warren. And 
and the rest of the people in that group. And I did. And uh, that was half of the Archigram group, although we never thought of ourselves in that way at the time. Meanwhile, Peter Cook had, had graduated from the AA, where he went for his final years, and had met with David Green and, Mar and Michael Webb. And they got together and decided something needed to be done about the, or needed to be said about the terrible state of English architecture at that time. And none of the magazines at that time would publish work that wasn't built work. So they decided to start their own magazine. And they decided then that they would call it Archigram as a shortening of architectural telegram. So the first paper, which was two sheets, came out in 1961. And that was the beginning of Archigram of the magazine. When we did the Living City exhibition, we weren't called Archigram. That was the name of the magazine. Yeah. And every, but everybody at that time was just referring to us as the Archigram guys. So we just decided, well, rather than trying to think up a name for the group, the easiest thing to do was to go with the flow and call ourselves Archigram. So there we were. Can you tell us about the epiphany of the plug-in city and uh, it's such a central concept in, in Archigram? Well, that, that's really a question for Peter rather than me, because I'm just an observer in this rather than a creator. But the plug-in city, again, we're talking about the way buildings might perform. We all live now in a totally plug-in environment. Everything. You and I are now plugged into the internet. Yeah. Our conversation is going, goodness knows by what route, but it's going through a software company somewhere in, I think, in California and coming back to us both sitting in London. We are plugged into an international communications network. And our buildings, the things that I and you are in, you. I don't know, you look as though you've got artificial light in front of you. You certainly got a, a video screen and a computer, which are plugged in again into the internet, but also into the power supply. You've, you've got everything around you like I have, books and publications. I can see what looks like either an iPad or a mobile phone sitting on top of a tube just behind your shoulder there. All these, everything we have is plugged into a network of some sort or other. Some of it is an invisible network. The, the, the um, facilities of those networks are often invisible. But we are in our dwellings or in our offices, we are plugged into these communication and transportation networks. All we were doing, remember this is 1964, it's 60 years ago nearly. We were looking at the, the implications of what was being developed at the time. There was no, there were no computers, no mobile phones. Uh, I, I moved into a, a building in, in, uh, in Camden Town in the end of the 60s. And it was a fight to get a telephone line. You had to have a shared line with the neighbor because the facilities for telephones were so rare at that time. Now I can have as many telephones or communication lines as I, I could possibly use. But the, the, the idea of the connected community, which is what Plug-in City was about, is something that was beginning to occur then, but it now is, is, is universal. The only way I could alter that was with a great deal of effort and involving, you know, solid masonry and steel beams. Yeah. 
But as this, our lives change, all of our lives have changed in the last 18 months because of the pandemic. Now, 18 months or two years ago, a meeting like this wasn't easily possible. There were things like FaceTime and so on. But to actually get together, there are only two of us now, but we could be talking to an audience of, of hundreds and involved in a conversation with that audience. And all of that audience could be located in any part of the world. And we'd be able to have an exchange, which is wonderful. But our, the environment we live in doesn't perform with the same sort of responsiveness as the electronic environment we live in. Yeah. And the Plugin City started with the idea that the environment itself should be physically able to respond to the changing way of life of the people who lived in it, not just at the individual scale, but also at the community and the urban scale. Thank you. That's such a great answer. And uh, one thing I wanted to ask you is, of course, about your very special role in the Archivam group, because you were conspicuously in charge of all the technical matters. You you are the inventor of things that go bang in the night. Yes, to quote um, Peter Cook, yes. <laughs> exactly. As I wanted to ask you to explain a little bit to us your role in terms of all technical matters. Uh, also of things that go bang in the night and also uh, in a way how, of course, you are so in, instrumental in actually the memory of Archigram in the archive, in the collection, in the recording, um, it would be great to hear more about that because, of course, this series um, for the Foster Foundation is very much about archives and, uh, I mean, we live in an age where we have more and more information. Um, but that does not necessarily mean that we also have more memory. You know, amnesia can somewhere be at the core of the digital age, which is why this work with archive is, is so important. Well, that, that's about a two hour answer you're adding yourself in for now. <laughs> if, if I start at the begin, my personal beginning, as I said, I decided as a child I wanted to be an architect. And when it came to applying to architecture schools. I applied to both Liverpool University and Manchester University. At that time, Liverpool University had a dust experience, the, the Sterling, Maxwell, Tom Stevens, all that group of graduates, and it was a, had a tremendous reputation for its aesthetics and its the quality of invention and thinking of its graduates and of its teaching staff, of course. And I was accepted to, to Liverpool University and was also expect, accepted to Manchester University. Yeah. Manchester University had a reputation of providing a very solid technical background in building and architecture. My interest then, which it is the same now, is that how things work, how things are done, not to, uh, to admit an interest in the aesthetics of things, but I didn't think that Liverpool would give me that background. So I decided to go to Manchester. The head of the school at Liverpool at the time was Professor Gardner Medwin, who I met some years later and tried to explain my reason, because he did, he, he asked me then, why was it that I turned down Liverpool in favour of Manchester? And I gave him that same explanation. I don't think it particularly convinced him, but at least he knew my reasons. Now, that feeling of mine, of liking to know how things work, has persisted right through my life from that 12 year old child who used to, you know, take apart uh, figuratively my mother's washing machine and put it back together again so that I knew how it worked. Not that that ever pleased my mother, but uh, that was the sort of child and sort of person I am. I like to know how things work and I like to be able to make things work. 
So that was the role that I played in Archigram. Now, the next stage in the, this, the reply to your multifaceted question is how I became the part of the group that was responsible for keeping records. That was fairly simple answer. My father, amongst other things, was a professional photographer. And I knew all about film, I knew about printing, I knew about developing film, I knew all the all, all that's necessary to take a decent photograph of something and to produce a reproduction of that thing. So when in the 1961, I became part of the South Bank group, working with Ron Heron and Warren Chalk, I could see there some very interesting sketches being done, which would never have got further than, than the drawing office we're all in. But I, I took those out of the office and photographed them because I thought the sketches themselves as a part of the story of the South Bank was very, were very important. And South Bank, the development of South Bank that the group was concentrating on was, of course, the new concert hall and the, and the art gallery to the side of the Royal Festival Hall. But our responsibility as a group was also to look at the whole of that development area, which if you look at the, I think it's 1958 London plan, County of London plan, you see in red an area that goes from Westminster Bridge to Blackfriars Bridge, which is defined as South Bank. So part of our brief at the LCC at that time was looking at how that might be developed. So we were not only looking at the art gallery and the concert hall, we were looking at the National Theatre site, we were looking at the site, the other side of Waterloo Bridge, or Princess Meadows. But as far as I'm aware, no, no history books that I've seen make any mention of those developments. Okay, there's a, there's a, there's a reference to the movement of the National Theatre site from the side of County Hall to the downstream side of Waterloo Bridge and Dennis Lyston's yeah. then development of the National Theatre. But there were all sorts of other things that went on that I thought were fascinating and should be recorded. So I recorded them. And from that beginning, I then, anything I saw that uh, looked even vaguely interesting, I would photograph it and keep a record of it. So that continued. And when Archigram itself got going in the mid 1960s, there were lots of demands for publication of our work. None of the other guys, okay, they could take a decent photograph, but they didn't know how to duplicate a photograph or to make copies that were suitable for publication. But I knew all that. So that's what I, that was my function in the group was to keep the records, to supply prints or reproduction of transparencies or whatever to, to for publication or for students, other people who might be interested. And that just carried on, it carries on today. I mean, I was doing that this morning. I was dealing with a, one of those sort of requests. And that, okay. I mean, that, that just to put it, actual time scale to it. That's what I did from 1961. The group then formalized in a way in 1969, right. when we won the competition for the development of the building in Monte Carlo. Yeah. One of the conditions of the contract to, to design that building was that we had to form a, a formal office. So Peter, Ron and myself became partners and eventually actually had an office building in Endell Street in Common Garden. Yeah. And a, a, a side remark to that is the building we occupied had been uh, oh, the theatrical photographer, and I can only think of the wrong name at the moment, 
Um, it'll come to me in a minute, but it, it's very famous theatrical photographer who, who is well was well known at the time for surrealist representations. We moved into a building that had been his studio, which fortuitously had a dark room already installed in the basement. So like it was me coming home. The Archigram office was forced to close in the in 1974, 75, because it was a there was a national economic meltdown. It was a three day week. We couldn't work, nobody could work more than three days a week in offices because all the power was switched off. We then Peter had become the director of the ICA. Ron and Warren went to work for a large commercial firm of architects. Uh, Mike Webb, for a long time already, had been teaching and working in the United States. And David Green had been in the United States, so they then came back and was living and teaching in Nottingham. But it's interesting because you, you that's of course all analog. Uh, and you have been, you know, building up this extraordinary archive of uh, Archigram as an analog archive. Yes. Uh, and of course, today we have, in addition to the analog archives, we have the digital archives. And very often, it's actually mixed. It's both there are elements in every archive. There are elements which are digital and elements which are analog. Um, and I was kind of wondering if you can talk a little bit how the archive sort of changed through digitalization. Um, and also how today the archive is is organized. I have several questions in relation to that because obviously for a long time um, it's uh, uh, it, I mean it's, archives are very slow. It takes a long time to get them organized. And usually I mean I've seen this always in my archive. I mean I've got about three thousand hours of interviews and and, and so many documents that actually um, the production is always faster than. The possibility to archive, so there's always a backlog, and I suppose, particularly with a, a, a group like Archigram, where you have different participants, there is so much material. Uh, so I was kind of wondering, first of all, how you dealt with this amount of material, and how then you organize the archive, um, and how it changed. So it's kind of three questions: how it changed through the arrival of the of the digital. Well, the digital arrived 10 years after the archive became formally organized. So the archive basically has worked from 1960 to 1975, 1976. Nothing was digital at that time. Everything, we all had drawing boards and repeater graphs and, you know, crayons and airbrushes. Everything was a physical piece of paper, tracing paper or cartridge paper or Watman or whatever. So the archive from the beginning was either photographic records or the actual original material. So by 1975-76, when we moved out of Endell Street, the vast majority was physical. There was nothing at all digital because there was no digital world at that time. Yeah. And all that material, or the vast majority of that material, I moved to my the house I was living in 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 by Regent's Park. So both of my children slept on beds which were based on plan chests. So and the the every cupboard in the in the flat was full of bits and pieces of materials of part portfolios or everything else. Now, digital only started in the mid 1980s. And I was fortunate enough because when Archigram ceased to operate as a group in 1975, 76, I was then teaching at the AA and Alvin Boyarski was the chairman of the AA. And Alvin, in the early 1970s, asked me to organize a teaching unit called the Communications Unit, which was a, about all the things in communications that fascinated me. Everything from drawing 
through to filmmaking, photography, silk screen printing, all those sort of things. I was the, I was running that department at the AA. At the same time, in the early or the mid 1970s, Alvin started having exhibitions and we started producing catalogues yeah. and the cat production of the catalogues was my responsibility. And that continued for nearly 20 years until Alvin died in the late uh, or died in 1990. So during that time, there was a transition from the physical into the digital. And I, I was responsible for that at the AA. So like learning about photography from my father, I learned all about how to digitize material whilst that was beginning to develop at the, AA, at the print studio in the AA that I was responsible for. So I was very fortunate. I mean, like now, I mean, the first publication was produced on what was called an Olivetri Selectric typewriter, yeah. which was a fancy typewriter, or it was a golf ball typewriter, but it was able to justify text on the line. You had to type the text twice, once so that it measured the number of characters, and the second time so that it spread them out to make a justified line of text. So we learned, learned all about the use of that equipment. We then moved on to an American company called CompuGraphic, which were producing photo setting machines. So the first one of those had an enormous drum, which you you put in negative um, strip of a negative that had all the letters of the alphabet and all the characters, numerals and everything else on that. And this thing spun around and there was a laser light that flashed to, to expose the photographic paper to the various characters that you wanted. And then after that, it started to be digital after being photomechanical. So I, I was involved intimately in all those developments. So changing the Archigram archive from a purely paper-based or film-based record to digitizing it was something that was very easy for me to do. And I do it now. I mean, I, you know, I'm sitting here, I've got three scanners or oh, four scanners, actually, one of them don't work, but I've got four scanners around my desk. I've got and how a camera. Can, and how can, sorry, yeah. So I've got a camera, a rostrum camera set up to, over my other shoulder, that shoulder. You can't see it. I mean, you know, it's not worth showing it to you particularly. But, uh, but uh, I've always been involved technically in the recording of material yeah and that that gives me the the ability to maintain the archive the archive now although all the physical material in the archive still exists it's it was the, the whole archive the physical record was sold to the m plus gallery in hong kong two or three years ago yeah i want to the ask you about stuff, this. I actually, yes, Dennis, I wanted to ask you about this because it's, of course, interesting because there are different possibilities for the, I mean, la longue durée, the long duration of an archive. Either one can start a known institution like uh, the Foster Foundation, you know, did in Madrid, and the other possibilities, of course, uh, which is also frequent to uh, connect an archive uh, to a bigger archive, to a museum, like uh, Harald Seemann's archive is in in the Getty, I think Cedric Price's archive is in um, Canada. Uh, mm, CCA. The CCA, Phyllis Lambert's organization. Uh, and, 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 and yours uh, is in, uh, in oh, Hong Kong. Oh. Now, I thought it was a very fascinating uh, when I read that decision because, of course, Archigram had such a huge impact also on Asian urbanism. You know, we did a show in the 90s called Cities on the Move. Uh, at the, it came to London, it came from the secession, and then I don't know if you saw it in 96, 97, he came to the Hayward Gallery. It was a show about urbanism in Asia, which actually curated with Wuhan Ru. Um, and, 
and metabolism played a role there, but also a lot of uh, different countries in Asia, Singapore, Indonesia, China, different forms of you know, urban models. Uh, and we realized there during research that Archigram has such a big impact, such an influence in Asia. So I thought it was an interesting decision that the archive, you know, would go to to M plus. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about what you, exp uh, you know, what you hope from that association, and also what prompted that decision. Well, the thing that prompted the ex the decision was I'm I'm now in my eighties, as most of the other members of the group. Well, all of the other members of the group are in their eighties. Those who have actually survived. We're not going to last forever. So having the stuff here in my plan chests was going to end sooner or later anyway. So it had to move into a, a proper location, a museum or gallery or something that had long term facilities for the storage of that material. So it, the decision was was one of practical a practical nature not academic the the curious thing was although the material the, there's an intermediate stage that we need to go back to to cover which was at the beginning of the 1990s the university of westminster here in london put in an application for a grant to digitize and to make available to the public, the Archigram Archive. And that they got a grant from the government to do just that. So between about uh, 101 and 109, Westminster built up a, re a digital record of most of the things in the archive. And that now is available. It's been online since 2010. The problem with that now is that it's stored on the Westminster servers. It's stored in a digital form, which is very rapidly getting out of date. The, the website itself, the technology for the designs of websites has moved on. So that website just in practical terms can't be updated. It can't be updated also because they spent all the money that they got in the grant and they don't have any finance for updating it. It's all there, but it will gradually disappear just because the technology will, that holds it will become redundant and get destroyed. Now, I don't know if Westminster have any plans to transition the records from the, the material they collected up to 2010 into another format, which will endure for another 10 years or whatever it might be. But this, is, this isn't just our problem. This is a problem with every digital archive. How do you store it? I mean, I've got on my shelf here, I've got endless hard drives, yeah. you know, with material on them. But the hard drives themselves begin to fail. So most of the ones on my shelf have failed. I, I transfer the material from them onto new hard drives before they actually fail. So I haven't lost any, any information over the years. But eventually, the, the method of storing it on either, well, on, on, in those, there are physical drives with spinning disks and reader heads and all the rest of it. I've got some SSD, which solid state drives, which also have the archives stored on them. So I'm trying to keep it up to date as far as possible. But eventually, the technology is going to change to something else. And I might well not be here at that time. So how is it going to be preserved? Hopefully, the people in Hong Kong will preserve it. But if you look at their website, their website is very young. I'm not really criticizing what they've done. But it's in, although you can access some of the archigram material now on their website, you can't by any means access all of it. But it's going to take them years 
to get all of it onto their website. And then you have to have a method of searching the website in order to access that material. It's all very well having it on your servers. But if somebody visiting your website can't access it, it isn't doing any good at all. No, that's a big problem. I mean, I've spoken, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you have and people at the Foster Archive have spoken about the problem of maintaining the integrity of records. And it is a, it's an ongoing problem. It changes from year to year. And as Jonas Mek has always said, uh, digital paranoia is very helpful because we need to have many backups because things can easily get lost. So yes. yeah. uh, I mean, it was wonderful, Dennis, to speak again after so many years. And thank you for this great interview. Uh, and I really hope we can meet again soon in person. It will be wonderful to see you. A pleasure. Nice it to talk to you. It's a great honor to do this interview. And it, thanks for your wonderful answers. Okay. Goodbye, thanks, then. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.